you got a sound, you know I wanna hear it. If you got a sound, if you got a sound, if you got a sound. These were the opening lines to the very first spoken word poem I ever wrote. And a decade later, this is the exact same message I wanna share with you all today. Put your voice out there, no matter how imperfect, no matter what unique brand of story you're telling, and encourage others to do the same. I'm a spoken word poet, so I say words pretty much anywhere people ask me to say them. I've written a German bike commercial, I performed at a fashion show fundraiser in nothing but a spandex onesie, and I poured my heart and soul into a tribute to a tapir, the most wonderfully weird 700 pound creature you'll ever meet. So it's definitely something different every day, and I love that. The overlap between all of these very unique experiences is that I help others share their voice in a way that people will listen. I take my delightfully nerdy little package of imagery, rhyme, alliteration, comparisons, and I weave them into an important idea. Since it's my job to help others share their voice, I think it's only fair to start off by sharing mine. So here's a poem about my life and where I came from. This one is called Stardust. When I was born, you held me. And from that first hold, gripping me greater than gold, I had no choice but to sparkle. Because you marveled at my every inhale and exhale, breathed love into me in heaping spoonfuls, until my lungs learned the glistening taste of love itself. And you held stardust in your eyes every time you looked at me, and after a while, that sort of thing rubs off. You see, I started to shine. And it was no fault of mine, but you fed me so much warmth I couldn't keep it inside, so. Now I'm a speck on the horizon, slowly gaining speed like a comet rising, but you still keep me grounded. Founded in logic, surrounded by love, you taught me all the lessons I could dream of. Like, you maybe tried three bites of every dish I said I hated, until I learned I had to take life on my own tongue and taste it. And when I fell, you did so much more than just kiss my scraped knees. You taught me how to put my hand just right on the ground so when I pushed myself back up, I'd be taller than I was before. You never sat on the front porch with a rifle waiting for my date to come by, but you armed me with enough intellect to choose someone who wouldn't need a gun. You complimented my terrible plays and bird sketches as much as my hair and my clothes and told me, acne-covered, brace face looking in the mirror, that when their puberty caught up with my brilliance, they would know I was worth fighting for. You were my unrelenting fuel source, who fed me flecks of brilliance that altered my course, so when I looked up and saw you flicker, I got scared. Because who's ever prepared to be told that the one who gripped them greater than gold has two months to shine? So I pressed your tired ribs against mine and felt the scarred lungs crackle. But even with the snap, crackle, pop, and the beating of the clock, the loudest thing in the room was not time. It was the sound of your arms wrapping around mine, telling me everything would be fine, because we had no regrets. And it wasn't just the Percocets talking. If death was knocking, you were ready to answer the door. Because every moment of our lives, we had something worth breathing for. We had always said our I love yous and meant it. We had rambled on like word nerds and bantered unrelented. You had made me bedtime stories and M-shaped pancakes. We had questioned things together and learned from our mistakes. You said you taught me all I needed to know. And now it was my turn to go and change the world. So now I marvel at your every inhale and exhale. Breathe love into the world in heaping spoonfuls until this earth 
learns the glistening taste of love itself. That poem is not actually a sad one. It's a poem of gratitude, not only because my dad outlived that diagnosis and continues to enrich my life to this day, but because it taught me the power of taking control of my story, of my narrative. At a time where I couldn't control what happened, I couldn't control my dad's health, I couldn't control if he left the planet, I could at least control the way I thought about it. So this is what I do now. I use poetry to write myself to a better place. Poetry becomes my mantra. It's the words I repeat over and over. So I try to create poems that plant the seeds of who I want to be and what I want to notice, because by the time I repeat them to a dozen crowds, it's going to sink in. So writing helps me focus on the things I might otherwise overlook. And I'm not just talking about a cloudless summer day documented in perfect cursive in a creaseless leather bag journal. I'm talking messy moments jotted onto a paper napkin with strike throughs and scribbles in the margins and arrows jutting in and pasta sauce smeared across the whole thing. See, there's power in inspecting each piece of life slowly, letting all the messy thoughts about it fall out in front of us so we can look at it and decide what we want to see in this. Is this nacho cheese disaster really a life-ending catastrophe? Or is it a funny shirt stain that we'll show our friends later? Is this snail in the alleyway with a periwinkle spiral just a passing detail? Or is it a metaphor for each beautiful being that lives unnoticed? You get to decide what each piece of life means to you. You get to reframe it, choose how you want to engage with it. There's no wrong way to interpret or respond to any moment, but it is yours to interpret. So whether your reflections have you rolling your eyes or sobbing into your bowl of cereal or just spending an afternoon mapping the swirling back current of a river, this is your chance to dig deeper into one moment. This is your chance to let the world teach you something. In short, it's not just about capturing the best moments or the worst moments in life, but about capturing any moment. If you can give it meaning, it's important. Maybe that's the thermos you left on top of your car, or the thud of a cat's paw on a full glass of water. Or, for someone like me, maybe that's a lifelong love affair with pasta. If you love puns, you're about to have a great time. If you don't love puns, we're going to try to fix that with this poem. Consider this your ted education. This one I wrote for the love of my life is called Ode to Pasta. With you, it was love at first bite. One taste and I tell you, it felt just right. Might have seemed at first like we were just noodling around. But you're not just some way for me to pass the time. You can always tortellini on me, and I can tortellini on you. You probably roll me out of bed in the morning and parmesan with me late at night. And you don't mind spicing things up a bit, because you oregano know what makes me tick, so we full on assy egg, go for it, bring on that cheesy romance with a saucy twist. See, we get along great. And you're always up for any date. You mac out with me when we're watching Netflix late. And when I'm feeling fancy, you suit up with bow ties. When I feel like my life is about to capsize, you gnocchi at my door. Burma chill me out. I gotta say, without a doubt, you spaghetti me better than anyone else. And man, it caught me off guard, but now it's hard to even be cannelloni without you. Because I'm crazy about you from my head to my tomatoes. And when I've had a matzo relatively long day, you let me know when I'm off base. Or when I should be giving you more of my time. My friends warned me not to fall too hard, said you might tag Leah, tell me lies, or even fed a cheat on me. But you have never done me wrong. 
We always get along macaroniously well. Your rigatoni of voice makes my heart swell. I can tell you complete me from A to Fuzili. My parents said you were just a phase, that I just hadn't tried the whole buffet. Well, let me tell you, I have sashimied my way around the world spring, rolled my way across different countries. I've even done some smoothing and forking that I'm not proud of. But even after trying the whole enchilada, I Mexican can't find anything that compares to you. Nothing can linguine me off of your love. I think I'm really far falling. So let's stay up together and watch Lady and the Tramp. Let me pepper you with compliments, assault you with affection, because I'm not Alfredo of your love. You can rock me, mama, with your wagon wheels. You can be my Yoko Orzo. Because whenever I see you, I want to more. I can't wait to see what we have in store. And when you ask what this poem is for, eh? it's for you, my favorite pastime. Whether we're talking about a punny pasta poem, or a life story, or anything in between, I am just a tiny spark that's meant to ignite more conversation. See, this talk is not about me. It's about everything that happens after I leave the stage. What memories or tangents or ideas did this spark in you? In the spirit of this yes and theme, it's time to add your voice, your opinion, create stories that bounce off mine or go in a completely different direction. And then you will spark the people that you talk to, and it will become this beautiful snowball effect of ideas avalanching into bigger ideas. So when this talk is finished, take one step in sharing your voice. You can share it with yourself, jotting a note in your phone about an idea you had or a line that spoke to you, you could share it with one person, like telling a stranger your favorite pun from today. <laughs> Just a suggestion. You could have that difficult conversation you've been putting off. You could sign up for that open mic list, or pick up that phone, or post that one view YouTube video. Or you could ask humanity, you could ask yourself what you would tell humanity if you had these 18 minutes. Now, on the note of sharing our voice and putting ourselves out there, I'd like to end on a poem that speaks to each of us as imperfect humans trying to do our best in this world. It's easy to silence ourselves by saying our story isn't as interesting or as funny or as whatever as the person next to us. But at the end of the day, we all worry that we're inadequate, and each of us is just trying to make the world a little better. So this one is dedicated to each flawed human. This one is called Imperfect. I admire her painting. It's nearly photographic. Next to her perfection, my poetry looks plastic, a kindergarten project made of marshmallows and matchsticks. And I imagine that her brush chasses its way across the canvas pulling out a perfect picture flawless and entrances, paintbrush dances like a prima ballerina, Anna Pavlova the easel, her arena. And I can't fathom how she does it, just like that. The same way a magician pulls a rabbit from a hat, she draws beauty from the blank. And I don't understand how someone can make something so perfect. See, I'm the kind of girl who stumbles on her every word. It's rough and tumble talk tripping out of my trap. Only after 50 revisions are my ramshackle raps apt for an audience. So I keep the delete button as my closest friend, delete, delete, closest companion. Erasing chunks of thought wider than the Grand Canyon. Then I fill them back in with little frills and fancy until the viewer can't see how imperfect I can be. So I shake my head in wonderment at her impeccable piece. More wrinkle-free and radiant than a shiny silk camise. And I stare at her smooth strokes and meticulous lines, and I find I'm baffled at how her brush can travel and unravel such flawless finesse. If she's the Mona Lisa, I'm a Jackson Pollock mess. But I guess 
What goes unseen is behind the scenes she gleans its every imperfection, makes countless corrections to nearly invisible sections of the canvas we overlooked, studies her every error closer than her favorite book, makes minute modifications to her creation shines and sparkles. And while the unknowing audience moons and marvels at her magnificent masterpiece, we may be startled to discover she still sees it incomplete. She could run her finger over every blemish and blot, show you each imperfect spot she concealed. If you peeled back the paint layer by layer, you'd reveal endless edits and alterations. Where she tweaked her illustrations, deepened the shadows, dabbled to add those tiny touches and flares, smoothed some straying strands of hair, and there, where we now see a faultless figure, there once stood a flawed form. See, being imperfect isn't the exception, it's the norm. Life isn't a pristine product, it's a process. We only approach perfection by correction, admitting we're not flawless. And I've never seen a beautiful life or a beautiful work of art that didn't evolve incessantly from its sloppy start. So make mistakes. Gift yourself to the world like a globby birthday cake, like a love note to humanity with a coffee stain smack dab in the middle. Let your life and art be riddled with richness, a gorgeous mess. Sometimes the mistakes are the most stunning part yet. So thank you to each artist that will lay your hardest heart work in the spotlight, who fought like mad to make a sliver of your soul expose. And thank you to those sitting in the dark. You are making art of your life, letting struggle and strife stain your existence stunningly becoming the next masterpiece of elegant inadequacy. Strive for sublimity. Fail fantastically. This is my coffee-stained love note to humanity. Thank you.